Assalamu alaikum. This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org slash donate. As little as $10 a month can help people find life-changing guidance. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Wal jannatu lil muwahideen. Wa la udwana illa ala al-zalimeen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil khalqi wal mursaneen. سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We welcome our brothers and sisters back to this new episode, episode 12 of our series of podcast, The Masters and Millennials. And uh, we've reached an end to our discussion on uh, دعوة إلى الله calling to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. And our author Habib Zain bin Sumayt. May Allah have mercy upon him and grant him a long life such that the Ummah is able to benefit from him for many years to come. Uh, he concludes this section that deals with da'wah calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after he spoke about the etiquettes of teaching and the etiquettes of calling. And here he speaks about ifta, the issuing of legal verdicts. And uh, even though the, 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 the issuing of legal verdicts is something that is generally left for senior scholars or teachers that may have reached a level of ifta, uh, a level of knowledge where they are capable of giving correct guidance in terms of uh, answering questions as to which is what is halal and what is haram. Um, uh, it's very sad that we observe that so many young students of knowledge are generally hastened to want to answer questions and many a times this stems from a problem within the lower self where a person wants to be known for his knowledge or he wants to be known for what he has learned to what he has read and our author here he speaks about ifta and he says that uh, our salaf when of course when habib zain refers to the salaf he is speaking of the he is speaking of the salaf among the sada al-ba'alawi and he said that their practice was such that there are three things that they used to push away. There were three things that nobody wanted the responsibility of. And that was qada, to hold the position of passing judgment qada, to hold the position of fatwa, issuing legal verdicts, and imama, to hold the position of being the uh, imam of a masjid or a community. And that was the, the, the reality of people whose desire was not to win favor or carry with any of the creation. And all they wanted was to please Allah. And they were not uh, worried how people see them, whether people saw them to be people of knowledge or people of leadership or people of being qudat. They were only focused and concerned about the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, uh, Habib quotes a narration, Habib Zain quotes a narration here where he reminds us of a narration from the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even though uh, the narration as far as I can recall is not entirely authentic but the wording is so beautiful that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is said to have said that أَجْرَأُكُمْ عَلَى الْفُتْيَةِ The most brave among you to issue fatwa those who hasten and they have the braveness within them just to pass fatwa without thinking and without research and without studying. And how many a person has not studied today but they want to argue their position and they want to argue that their fatwa was correct or their answer was correct. The Prophet said the most brave of you to issue fatwa despite not having the uh, fulfilling the requirements to answer questions to issuing fatwa, أَجْرَعُكُمْ عَلَى النَّارِ will be the most brave of you to uh, into the fire of Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an, he once came across a qadi, a judge. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an asked him that, uh, do you know al-nasikh wal um within the Quran and within the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the uh, idea or the concept of abrogation, which verses or which hadith abrogates other verses, and other hadith, and similarly which verses and hadith are abrogated by other verses. Do you know the nasikh and mansuh? And he said, no, I do not know them. And Sayyidina Ali responded to him saying that you are destroyed and you are destroying others. 
Um, and uh, uh, some of the scholars, they mention that if a question comes your way and three days has gone by since you last read the answer to that question, then fala tufti, do not give the fatwa, except after going to check the question once again. And I've encountered this a few times, may Allah pardon us, uh, many a times in a class of fiqh we tend to uh, issue and give answers to questions and only to realize afterwards that I may have confused one mas'ala with another mas'ala or I might have misunderstood something and then one of course needs to rectify himself and that's very important if ever in a class wherever you may find that you may have imparted knowledge that was incorrect hasten to reach those people to inform them that whatever you may have parted to them was was incorrect now and Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala he said that uh, I have not issued fatwa until 70 people that has reached the status of issuing fatwa has uh, given me permission to do so has uh, they they gave testimony that I am from the people of fatwa only after 70 people uh, uh, confirm that I have reached a status where I am able to give fatwa only then have I uh, did I start giving fatwa? And look at the, the the attitude of the scholars. Look at the weariness of the scholars and compare that to so many young men and young students today and how overly eager they are to want to be the mufti and sometimes not being the mufti, they want to question the mufti and then they want to criticize the mufti and they want to speak ill of this one and that one as if all knowledge lies with that young man. Our teacher, uh, Sheikh Mu'ad Ali, he said to us once that uh, when he was studying in a Darul Ulum, similar to a Ribab, he said that um, uh, because of the lack of space, there were some first-year students that came to study the Arabic language, sleeping in their room, and at that time, they were in their final year of studies, in the final year of a six- or seven-year program. And uh, because they were in the final year of their studies, Sometimes students in their second, third, fourth or fifth years would come to their room to get some guidance or ask some questions, you know, and to get some guidance from the senior students that were sitting in their final year. And he said it was remarkable that whenever somebody came to their room asking a question, young students that just began studying in their first year were the first people to answer. <laughs> and that's the nature of uh, man today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to know our place and we and we've made this prayer many a times in the past may Allah make us true students of knowledge and uh, a man once came to Abdullah ibn Abbas asking him a question and he found that Abdullah ibn Abbas was praying, making salah and then uh, someone, one of the students of Abdullah ibn Abbas someone that attended the gatherings of Abdullah ibn Abbas the man asked him that something exited from my private do I have to perform ghusl? And the man responded, yes, ghusl is compulsory upon you. And then the questioner left. Abdullah ibn Abbas, when he completed his prayer, and he heard the question in his salah, he said, catch up with that person that presented this question and tell him that uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas say, asks whether the substance that came out of his private, did it come out with enjoyment or without enjoyment? And when the man responded that it came out without any pleasure, did it exit with pleasure or without pleasure? And when he responded that it did not exit with pleasure, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and said that there is no ghusl or compulsory upon that person. And then he, the one who answered while he was praying, one of his students, Ataba man ajabahu ashadda al mu'ataba. Abdullah ibn Abbas took him to task and reprimanded and censured him in a severe manner saying to him that everything has a pillar and the pillar of this deen is fiqh and one faqih, one jurist is more intense upon shaitan than 1,000 worshippers oh ma hadha ma'nahu Naam. and thus we find that the scholars were generally very particular when it came to answering questions and this is something we need to learn if I find myself needing to answer a question then I may say that uh, I've heard such and such a scholar or I may have read in such and such a book, but I'm not too sure. I'm not 100% sure. Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, when he used to narrate hadith from Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
uh, fearing that he may attribute something to the Prophet that the Prophet وسلم, did not say he would become nervous and shaky and he would begin sweating and then he would narrate that the Prophet وسلم, said and he would add to the end or oh, something like this oh, kama qala alayhi salatu wasalam. the thoroughness is something that we must develop as students of knowledge and we shouldn't have that tajarru that audaciousness to want to answer and debate and uh, show off with the little knowledge that I have, I should realize that uh, the knowledge that I have compared to some of the great scholars in the world and some of our teachers is but a drop in an ocean and then all the knowledge on the face of this earth in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only a little وَمَا أُتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And tied into this discussion, you and I, we need to learn to say I do not know. I do not know لا أدري Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala and he said that a oh man, whoever learns something, he should utter that which he has learnt. And whoever did not learn something, he needs to say, Allahu a'lam, Allah knows best. Now, because from knowledge is to say regarding what you do not know, Allah knows best. And it's narrated, uh, attributed to Sayyidina Ja'far al-Sadiq radiallahu ta'ala an but also to uh, another scholar, uh, some attributed to Sayyidina Ja'far al-Sadiq and some to uh, Abu Dhiyal or Dhiyal uh, that they were asked and he said, لا أدري, I do not know. So he said rather, he said that when you are asked, then say, I do not know. Because if you say, I know, people will continue asking you until you do not know. And when you say, I do not know, people will continue teaching you until you know. <laughs> Subhanallah. So we have opportunities to learn. But the key to learning is first acknowledging that I don't know. And therefore, uh, many of our teachers, they mention that one should enter a class or a lecture or a workshop as an empty cup, willing to receive, not as a full cup, unable to, to receive. Now, and Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his majmu stated, that the belief of the muhaqqiqeen, the, 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 the scholars of tahqiq, is that when a scholar says, La adri, I do not know, it does not drop his status in any way. It does not lower his status in any way. But rather when a scholar is able to say, I do not know, it is a proof of his high status. It is proof of his taqwa. It is proof of his uh, 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 perfection in terms of knowledge because from knowledge, as we previously mentioned, is to say, I do not know when I am unfamiliar with a particular mas'ala. No. And Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Shafi transmits that I saw Imam Malik on one occasion when people presented to him 48 questions, mas'alas. And of those 48, for 32 of them, yani meaning that uh, 16 he answered. Of the 48 questions, he asked in 16. And for 32 of them, he said, La adri, I do not know. And actually what happened here was, as it comes, as it is mentioned elsewhere, that a delegation, a delegation came to Medina al munawwara with 48 difficult questions presenting to Imam Malik. And Imam Malik was busy at the time. So they said, but the delegation is here to meet you. And he said, I cannot meet them now. What are the questions? And the student read the questions. And Imam Malik answered 16 of them. And for 32 of them, he said, I do not know. So the student said, oh, Imam. And this is the love that the student has for the teacher. So he said, oh, Imam. Uh, these people have come from afar to ask Imam Dar al-Hijra, the Imam of Medina al munawwara these questions. How do I tell them that you're saying you don't know? I don't know. So he repeated himself again and he said, Go to them and tell them that Malik, the Imam of Darul Hijra that you're speaking about, tell them Malik does not know. And he did not see any fault therein. Subhanallah. Uh, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Abdullah ibn Abbas, both of them are reported to have said that a person who issues a fatwa, uh, and he answers every question that is presented to him as if he knows everything, that's a sign that the person is, is mad. 
So there's two things we need to take from all these narrations and we conclude with this is that the station of fatwa is not the job and the duty of every person. Uh, we are not saying that one cannot engage and when discussing with peers or friends that one cannot issue answers. No, we can and we should quote our references but we should know that uh, only a person that has reached a certain level of knowledge and received permission from his teachers to start issuing answers on a public level and in public spaces, such a person should يتصدر للإفتاء should present himself to answer questions for the public and that is not the doing of every student. Naam, unless there is permission given from a teacher. Secondly, when I err in my teachings or my advice or an answer that I have given, I should hasten to rectify myself. If my question answer, incorrect answer went public, then I should hasten to rectify myself publicly. And thirdly, you and I, we need to learn to say, I do not know. For men that were far greater than us, men, we will never be able to, not in a hundred lifetimes, be able to reach the amount of knowledge that they had. Those great men, they were able to say, La adri, I do not know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us these qualities. Ameen ya, Rabbil Alameen. In our next podcast, we'll be speaking about acting upon knowledge. Insha'Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaneen. Wa alhamdulillah. Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the Global Islamic Seminary. Visit SeekersGuidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit SeekersGuidance.org slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.